Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Conrad, and welcome to my talk, Threat Hunting via DNS. Uh, this is a fast-paced talk. I've got 42 slides in 45 minutes, plus questions. If you've seen me give talks before, you know I, I like to pack in as much information as possible, as much Monday morning value as possible. And I put a copy of this talk on my website, ericconrad.com. That link's right in front of you now. Sam will later post this, the same link that brought you to the live webcast will bring you to the archive webcast, including the webcast itself and my slides. But if you want those slides right now, feel free to download them at ericconrad.com. Now this, this talk is in three parts, really. It's the state of DNS encryption, because that's the, uh, the 800 pound elephant in the room, and a uh, gorilla in the room. <laughs> and uh, then how to get logging despite the state of DNS encryption, and then what to do with those logs. So there's a lot packed in here, but I can't talk about threat hunting via DNS without talking about DNS encryption, because that is coming on like a freight train. Again, the slides are there at ericconrad.com. I will hold questions to the end. If you have a question, just type it in the window, and then I'll circle back to those at the end. So uh, many best practices say, you know, log your DNS with um, somehow. Uh, everyone's favorite is Zeek. You know, use Zeek to, to grab DNS off the network. And then there's all kinds of threat hunting goodness you can glean from DNS. Domain ge uh, generation algorithms. You can look for what we call baby domains, which were registered very, very uh, recently, which is an, an indicator of compromise. You can look for thousands of names or subdomains um, per, you know, re uh, requested per uh, domain name, like, you know, a thousand different things dot Google dot com is not common, but for malware, that's very common, right? Um, so you want to log DNS, not just for correlation, correlation is great, but you want to log it for threat hunting. And and for, for my money in a Windows environment, the number one source for threat hunting data in a Windows environment is Windows, our Windows event logs. The number two source is DNS, right? Uh, many sites don't log DNS. If you do log DNS, it's for correlation. That's fine. I like DNS primarily for threat hunting. And we'll talk about the threat hunting in the final third or so of this talk. And everyone's favorite mine is Collectum with Zeke, formerly known as Bro, of course, now Zeke, named after the dog on the far side. And why it's one-stop shopping. You put an IDS sensor before your final hop, firewall hop out to the internet, your umbrella sensor, as we call that IDS sensor, Answer. You run Zeek there, you get every request going to the internet. So it's one-stop shopping. It scales well. You can also log on the DNS servers. You can also log on the endpoints themselves. We'll talk about how Sysmon has an amazing feature allowing you to tie DNS requests to the client uh, application that made that request, which is an abs absolute killer feature. And if you log on the DNS server, there's a number of ways to get that bind. And Windows has certainly improved from the old text file to the new Windows event log format. Uh, queries are easy, responses are hard. Uh, responses on, on bind require debug level 10, and that stuff is just nasty. So queries are easy, responses are hard, at least on bind. Uh, Zeek, it's all easy on the network because it's all simply there on the network. And, and again, we'll talk about Sysmon. But again, I can't talk about uh, sniffing DNS and analyzing DNS or logging DNS if I don't talk about DNS encryption. And um, many people have been caught flat-footed by this, especially Firefox users who may not be aware they've been upgraded to DOH, uh, DNS over HTTPS. We'll talk about that in detail coming up shortly. And obviously there's a bit of push on, on the internet for ever more encryption, TLS 1.3, uh, QUIC, which is basically HTTP 2 over UDP port 443 and port 80. So we're moving towards this ever encrypted world for, for our web traffic and now DNS is also becoming, well, web traffic, right? And we'll talk about the competing standards and, and what this means for me and you as network uh, defenders, right? Now, I'm a realist. Uh, I'm not making any, any kind of political uh, statement about encrypted DNS. Me, as Citizen Conrad, I love this stuff. I love the fact that at home right now, in my home office right now, my DNS in Firefox cannot be inspected by uh, my cable modem company, Spectrum Cable. Um, I like that. So as Citizen Conrad, I'm a big fan of this. As Network Defender Conrad, I have a different take on it. And, and there's an old saying, uh, my network, my rules, right? And I've been saying that for a long time, right? My network, my rules. And the privacy you gain at home is certainly worth it as Citizen Conrad's opinion. But at work, I, I want to keep visibility in that threat hunting data because there's so much threat hunting data there. And like a lot of privacy discussions, there's trade-offs between security and privacy. And as a citizen, I fall squarely in the privacy camp. As a network defender, I find being private on the internet or more private, we'll talk about how private it actually is. Um, it's most DOH and DOT, as we'll discuss, is eventually resolved via traditional DNS, as we'll discuss shortly. 
Um, I'm fine with my, my users having more DNS privacy, more of it on the internet. That's fine as, as a network defender. But I want to see what those, those uh, clients resolving is I want to spot malware. Now, we'll talk about your DNS encryption policy. Your policy may differ from mine, both personally and professionally. That's fine. But in the end, let's understand our options, discuss our options, and make some informed decisions on how we go about this, right? And again, I'm a realist. DOH is here. So let's deal with reality. I don't want to argue whether it's good or bad. It's here. So um, let's just deal with reality and um, you know, uh, defend accordingly. Two competing standards that do the same thing in a slightly different way. DOT and DOH. DOH is HTTPS. We'll talk about that. It is simply a web application. And determining this is DOH or th th this is just a web app accessed via HTTPS is actually very difficult in some cases. We'll talk about that. DOT is also encrypted DNS. Both use TLS to encrypt DNS, but DOH uses port 443 like every other TLS app or HTTPS app. DOT uses its own dedicated port 853. The plus side of that is as a, as a network defender, you know that's happening and you can block that. The downside of that is you, you, the network defender or the network you're on can block that. So me as network defender Conrad, I, I at least know there's DOT in my network. But what if I'm a, a citizen in a country where, that in, um, wants to inspect my web traffic? What are they going to do, right? They're going to block it. Right. So just like the, all these privacy discussions, it gives and it takes. If I'm at home or on the road, uh, I don't want the ISP blocking my DOT and downgrading me to normal DNS. That's now called DO53, by the way. I can, I can thank Jim Troutman for teaching me that term. DO53, we used to have to say traditional DNS, unencrypted DNS, over typically over UDP port 53 for requests lower than 512 bytes. <sighs> and now I can just say DO53 to encapsulate all of that, right? So if, if some you know network I'm on as as a you know it's it's a hotel or a coffee shop or in a foreign country blocks DOT to force me back to DO53 I don't want that but as a network defender at work there's pros and cons and DOT keeps the control plane separate from the data plane if you're a network engineer you know these terms the data plane is your user's data the control plane is how you manage your devices right and DOT keeps those planes separate DOH mixes the control plane and the data plane. And um, again, I'm a realist, DOH is simply winning. We'll talk about how and why, but those are the two differences there. As a network defender, I can easily block DOT. I cannot easily block DOH, which is both a feature and a bug, depending on what side of the privacy argument you're on. And again, uh, Jim Troutman gave a great talk, a ShmooCon talk. He won the Fire Talk Award, I believe, this year. Great talk. He taught me a lot on this. So download that talk. He's given that talk a few times since. And um, you can't go wrong. He is more of a large scale ISP view, which I don't really have anymore, or really ever. So it, it's a good, um, uh, you know, um, complimented viewpoint to this talk. Check it out. So who's winning? DOT is gained most traction in Android phones. If you're running the current version of Android, you're using DOT right now. That's called DNS private mode. If you're using um, other phones of Linux, it's easy to turn DOT on, but it's not on by default uh, in, in most cases that I'm aware of. But DOH is just crushing it. DOH is on in Firefox in the US by default today. Uh, as long as you didn't opt out, it's on in the US. Not in Canada, as I learned. So thank you, Canadian friends who answered my tweet today. And um, it's also rolling out Chrome in Chrome now. And Windows 10 Insider Preview also supports DOH at the operating system level. Now, Chrome and Firefox on the browser level, Windows 10 is your operating system level. That gives you an indication of where we're going. This is the insider preview. Now, I never signed up for the Windows beta program. When I saw this, I did. If you have a Microsoft account, it's easy. It's free. So I, I just asked to be in the, the beta program. I clicked the button, and now I am. And I downloaded the insider preview, and I have it. Now, that requires a kernel change to turn on the ability to do it. It's not on by default, DOH. If you make a kernel change, not a kernel change, sorry, a registry key change, excuse me, I was thinking about Linux. A registry key change, um, then new options appear in your control panel and you can turn on DOH um, with the insider preview. Paul Vixie is unimpressed by DOH as uh, he's very opinionated, opinionated, excuse me, and he wants to keep the control plane and the data uh, plane separately. He is not having any of this, but his argument, at least as a uh, mind share or <laughs> features enabled around the planet, he's losing the argument. I actually agree to keep the control plane and the data plane separately as a network engineer. Um, I agree, but as I said, I'm a realist and DOH is simply winning. It's not going anywhere. 
And if you're using Firefox now in the US, you got this pop-up uh, fairly recently and the default is okay, I got it. And the non-default is to disable it. And if you click okay, got it at some point or your users did, you may have forgotten you did this. I actually had till someone reminded me today on Twitter. I polled Twitter to see, um, you can see that Eric, Eric underscore Conrad. If you want to join my poll, by the way, it's not too late. Eric underscore Conrad, if you're sitting anywhere in the planet. Um, I've heard from US, Canada. I'd love to hear more. Anyone else, is this turned on? Only US has said yes so far. So because uh, it's it's a fast moving thing. So uh, Firefox flipped the switch in the US, Chrome is flipping the switch in the US now, right? And um, if you said yes, that's what you get. And it's controversial what Firefox did. If you said yes and your, and your provider was not Cloudflare, guess what, now it's Cloudflare. And whatever your company set as your local DNS server is now being overridden by Firefox if that user clicked yes and your organization has not done anything else, we'll talk about what you can do to change that. And this is my, Twitter poll today. I didn't get everyone in the last seconds. I got some more, but thank you for everyone. John, Andrew, Richie B, Brian, and Uber, Uber T 3 K. I'm probably saying that wrong. Uh, I heard from another Canadian uh, in the waning minutes before this talk. And it looks like Canada's off. US is on as long as you didn't say no. And the rest of the world appears to be off. But again, feel free to continue joining my Twitter poll. Just, just tweet right back at me, Eric underscore Conrad. You'll see these responses. These are from the last hour or so. I would just hour or two, I just want to get the current state as of today because it changes fast, right? And again, this is controversial. Firefox uh, changes your DNS provider. If, if the user said yes, your provider is now Cloudflare if it was not already. It bypasses whatever local DNA, uh, DHCP settings you got. Uh, it bypasses uh, Sysmon's logging. It bypasses everything. It exists only inside Firefox straight out to the DOH server it hits. You can log in the client, but the logging is nasty. I turned it on. It's basically debug style logging, but you can log in the client, right? Chrome, I like Chrome's approach better. Chrome says, okay, if you're using one of those uh, providers listed down there in the second sub bullet, you know, below, below, second bullet from the bottom, I should say, we'll upgrade you from DOH to DO53 uh, DO rather than DOH. If you're not using one of those providers, we'll leave you alone. I, you know, changing your provider seems a bit aggressive, but Firefox is a bit of a holy warrior on the, on the privacy front. And I understand why, because what do I get with your DNS data? I say this as a former HIPAA security officer, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act at the second largest healthcare provider in New England, former, stress on former. <laughs> I'm happy to formally be, be that, not currently be that, by the way. A lot less stress in my life. But my team also handled all investigations for a 12,000 employee company. With your DNS data, I get a lot. I know your love life, I know your financial life, I know your health life, I know if you're employed or unemployed. I know a lot about you, or I can certainly infer a lot about you based on your DNS data, even not touching the web data, which is another gold mine. DNS alone tells me a lot about you. So your ISP knows a lot about you if you're not using these technologies, right? And the, your ISP can sell that. Your ISP can say, you know what, if you type a name, name that does not resolve, we will redirect you to a server that serves you banner ads and we'll make money off that. I already pay my ISP. I don't want them to make more money though. I don't want them to sell my private data in some form or another, right? I've already paid them. We already had a cash transaction. That's good. That's good, right? So I don't want my, DNA, my ISP doing that, right? I'm not saying they're evil. I just say I don't want them to do that. Again, having done many acceptable use policy violations of many people over the years, some of whom got fired for things they did at work, DNS tells you a lot about a lot about that person. So it's, it's a very sensitive private thing. I like Chrome's approach more nuanced. I understand why Firefox and Mozilla are being holy warriors here because I get it. Because your DNS data in some countries is dangerous, depending on the country you're in and, and the political views you may have, or perhaps the religious views you may have, that can be dangerous for you and your loved ones. So I understand Firefox's point, and I'm a realist. If I'm using Firefox, I can change these things, but I'm a realist. Okay, let's, let's roll with the flow here. So backing up the bus a little bit, what's your policy? What's your policy at home? What's your policy at work for encrypted DNS or your company's encrypted DNS policy? You should have a policy. And your policy might be ride that wave. I love it. At home, I'm riding that wave. In fact, I'm enhancing that wave by using my own custom DOH server. Because as I'll show you shortly, at some point, it's going to hit the internet in most cases, plain text. Much like a VPN going to the internet, you're just pushing the unencrypted part further out. But at some point, it's going to be unencrypted in most cases. I'll explain one counterexample. I'm sure there's others, right? So um, personally, I, I am embracing the privacy. I love it. Uh, maybe a at your company, you do that too, but there's still decisions to be made there, right? 
Um, so, or maybe just you want to force it back to DO53. Okay. Or maybe you want to log that stuff locally encrypted and then let it out unencrypted. Or you could place a cloud DOH server uh, that you control, as I've done, to get the plain text part past the ISP. There's lots of options here, right? And as I said down the bottom, at some point, most of it's hitting uh, the internet unencrypted. One counterexample, as you see there, if the DOH server is also an authoritative name server, it's going to stay there. Or I suppose it's a caching server that's already cached response. Okay. But in most cases, you're just pushing the unencrypted part further out. Here's a traditional DO53 diagram, right? And you can sniff almost anywhere. You can sniff really anywhere. You can log on your DNS server. I won't get into split DNS and split split DNS. That's a whole other conversation. I could talk about DNS for hours. I could talk about TLS 1.3 for hours. I could, <laughs> I could keep going, but I have 45 minutes, well, less now, but, uh, a half an hour now. So I won't. But this is how it's traditionally done, and anyone can sniff anywhere, which is good for you using Zeek. But remember, that's also true on the internet. That's also true of your ISP, right? Uh, so this is very flexible. This is easy, but this is changing. So here's a third-party DOH. If you're using Firefox in the US and you didn't opt out, this is it. And that's Cloudflare. But you see there on the right-hand side, at some point, it's going to be unencrypted. That's getting past your local uh, Zeek sniffing, which is not easy to do, short of TLS interception. Your ISP is not going to do that. See it. Cloudflare sees it, but they have an AUP, right? I, I can read their privacy policy. I can say, does Cloudflare's privacy policy make sense? And remember, I can change what Firefox did, and I have personally, right? I can read Cloudflare's um, privacy policy or Google's cloud, um, you know, a privacy policy for DNS or Quad9, et cetera. And at some point, you got to trust someone usually right so that's what that's what firefox is doing today unless you've changed it in the us uh here's a local option so you set up a doh server internally you log there you can also sniff with zeek on the other side of, of your uh, dns server internally the thing you're missing there is i don't know what client from a zeek perspective i don't know what client actually made the request the, the server should there certainly does the server can log um, but from a network's perspective, the source of this will be your recursive DNS server. If you want to disable in Firefox as an enterprise, it's it's one-stop shopping. You simply prevent that name from resolving. If your local clients can't resolve that name, they will not use DOH. So that, that's one-stop shopping. Don't touch any endpoints. Just don't resolve that name. Forbid it from resolving. Firefox won't use it. Or you can go through the settings. You, this could be managed through GPO as well, group policy objects. Chrome has no canary domain support, however, it's simple. If you're not using one of the supported providers, it won't upgrade, right? Upgrade to, to DOH. So simply don't use one on the list and you won't upgrade, right? And remember, it's not on by default in Chrome. It's rolling out in the US now. Last I checked, which was last weekend, my Chromes were not using it. If you want to check your Chrome to see if you are and let me know, same poll. Not a poll, it's just a, a post, I should say, a tweet. Uh, let me know, I'd love to hear. Now, I recommend this. There's an old saying in the industry, eat your own dog food. And I set this up because I kept reading about DOH and DOT. And I'm like, I had students asking me about it. And what does it look like? Can you determine, you know, from a detective standpoint that it is DOH? I'm like, you know what? I'm Instead of Googling answers, because no one had a good answer, by the way. Some of the answers I saw that were wrong. I'm like, I've just set this thing up. Eat my own dog food, meaning use it, right? So I found this guide and a huge, huge shout out. Man, it was easy. Sub 10 minutes, I was rocking and rolling with, with Pi Hole, which I'd meant to set up anyways. So I've got my own custom DOH server running in DigitalOcean's cloud, a Linux VM that cost me $5 a month, and I've pushed all my Firefox DNS encryption out to DigitalOcean. But again, who do you trust? DigitalOcean can now see that stuff, but my local ISP cannot, right? And I get the added benefit of a Raspberry Pi, well, a Pi hole, I should say. It's called a Pi hole. It was designed to be installed on a Raspberry Pi. I'm, I'm not running it on a Raspberry Pi. It's just Linux software. But uh, Pi Hole is a great solution for a lot of things, including your smart TV, your, your smart appliances. Remember Hypenin's law, Miko Hypenin, uh, when a device is called smart is vulnerable. And one of the things smart TVs do, like Vizio smart TVs, is unless you turn it off, they can track every pixel on the screen, irrespective of input, and, and uh, determine what show you're watching, what commercial you're watching. They, they can tell irrespective of, in, of input. You could be watching high def cable over the antenna and they know what you're watching based on pixel tracking. If you're watching over your Apple TV, then uh, the TV knows what you're watching and they sell that data. In fact, it's more expensive to sell a dumb TV than a smart TV because they, they can't sell your data on a dumb TV. 
and the amount of money they make on the data is larger than the amount of uh, money it costs to make your TV smart, meaning put a small Linux server inside of it, right? I don't want my TV tracking me pixel by pixel. So, so turn that off and also connect your smart devices to a pie hole and suddenly your TV browsing experience will be much better. So pie hole is great. Mix that with DOH or DOT. I was up and running in 10 minutes and I did that just as a test to write this talk and I've kept it. I think it's great. It's well worth my five bucks a month to push my privacy at least out to the uh, the, the cloud. And from there, again, it's going to be DO53, but I like that. It works well. Now, when, when you start wondering, you know, how do I determine this is DOH? It's simply a web app accessed via HTTPS. And a, a lot of people saying, I want to detect DOH. Okay, DOH to a known server, 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 yeah, that's easy. Unknown server, like the one you're looking at, dns.zez.me. Now, I called it dns.zez.me, but I could call it anything I want xyzzy.zez.me. So trying to determine that this is DOH is trying to determine a specific web application that's being accessed via HTTPS, because that's all it is. That's all it is, right? So I set it up, it's just a web app. How do I know access via post? How do I know that's, that post is sending a DNS request? You don't unless you inspect the TLS. You actually decrypt the TLS, right? And now I can log locally on my own DOH server, which I'm doing. And as I said earlier, it's simply a post. And detecting an unknown DOH resolver is like detecting an unknown, uh, well, uh, 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 application, an HTTPS application uh, uh, access via TLS, right? How do I know it's being posted? How do I know what options are being posted when it's encrypted with TLS? You don't unless you're decrypting it. Again, known, known uh, DOH servers, easy. Unknown, well, I suppose you know about mine now, but if I set up a new one <laughs> and give it a less obvious name, <laughs> that's going to be tougher now, isn't it, right? And a lot of um, misinformation on what the SNI uh, reveals for a DOH request. The server name indication indicates the virtual host name of that TLS server, of that HTTPS server more specifically. And it doesn't tell me the request, the DNS request that's carried. Because when the TLS handshake happens, the, or the X509 handshake, the DNS request is unknown. It has, has not been sent yet. The, the DNS request is sent after the handshake is complete. So the DNS request is unknown. I simply know the name of the HTTPS server I'm talking to. If it's the SNI, and it's not an encrypted ESNI. I know we have ESNI as well. So assuming it's SNI, the non-encrypted SNI, I know the virtual name of the HTTPS server. That's it. Again, there's a lot of misinformation out there. And, and again, eat your own dog food. But when I'm going you know, to write a talk, I set up sniffers, I deploy the technology. In this case, I kept the technology because I love it. And I know the virtual host name of that web server, which is useful. And there's privacy implications there as well, which is why we have encrypted you know, SNI, right? But it doesn't tell me the name of the, uh, the DNS query. It doesn't tell me it is a DNS query. Now, again, I, I used an obvious name here, dns.zez.me, but I could have easily called it xyzzy.zez.me. And good luck knowing that's a DNS request. You just know it's a web app that's encrypted. That's all you really know, unless it uses a well-known name. So as I said, you want to block known resolvers? That's easy. There's lists out there you can Google. And if I Google, if I block 8.8.8.8 port 443, magically one of Google's DNS servers stops. They all have multiple. Many have, um, uh, you know, family-friendly versions, you know, family-safe, you know, DNS servers. Certainly OpenDNS does that. I see some questions rolling in. I'll handle those at the end, but thank you for asking questions. And I'll answer them in order. Um, so, they, they, you know, Google has a bunch. Cloudflare has a bunch. They have the primary. They have backup. There's IPv6. Remember IPv6. There's family-friendly, but there's still, it's pretty easy to, you know, block if you want to, most of these. But these are the known resolvers, right? Unknown, whole different story. Now, is malware starting to use DOH? You bet it is. Is a lot of it right now? No, that I've seen. And let me know your experience. If you can just, again, if you want to follow up on my post, or I'm econrad at gmail.com, one of my many email addresses. I think I listed econrad at backshore.net. But another one is econrad at gmail.com, easy to remember. And um, if you have any data on, I, I saw some, some stories on malware using DOH. If I were evil, and I'm not, and our evil black hat, would I be using DOH or my malware? You bet I would. You bet I would. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so that wave's coming. It's not quite here yet uh, from what I've been seeing. Um, but malware's adoption of DOH is going to – it's too smart not to do it. And criminals are not dumb. Well, some are. But uh, there, there are some very smart criminals. Uh, although I've been surprised at how slow the uptake has been on malware this way. But that, that, it's too smart not to do. If I were evil, 
I, I'm using DOH, but not for evil. But if I were evil, I'd be using DOH for evil. <laughs> now, network-based DOH detection. The good news, but the bad news is signatures aren't doing anything unless it's a known IP address, right? The good news is it looks just like beaconing. Man, it is beaconing. If you've ever, you know, beaconing is when the malware phones home. DOH looks like very, very aggressive beaconing, right? Very aggressive beaconing. Because how many times does your Firefox resolve a name? In like an hour, you're talking thousands and thousands of times, right? Thousands of times. So that looks like beaconing because you want to, and typically you're going to pick one DOH server and stick with it, right? So if you're using 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 .8 port 443, you're going to send that thing thousands of packets per, per hour, maybe more, maybe tens of thousands, right? So if you're looking for beaconing already, which you should be, great tool, Rita, give a shout out to John, John Strand and Black Hills InfoSec and the band of crazy ninjas that work at Black Hills InfoSec. Me and John have discussed beaconing over the years and uh, Security 511 had a fairly simplistic view on beaconing. John came up with a way better in, in, his, in his great team, not to diminish his awesome team. He's got more GSEs per capita than any company on the planet and that's smart. And uh, S, uh, um, STI grads as well. So they came up with Rita. You should be looking for beaconing anyways, because beaconing is a classic way for you know C2 command and control malware phones home, right? ET phones home and malware phones home. And Rita will catch beaconing in a more intelligent way than me and Seth came up with initially for, for Security 511. Um, so if you're looking for beaconing, you've already detected it. And that is the best way, short of TLS decryption, that is the best way to detect DOH. You will detect it again. Again, it looks like very aggressive beaconing. That's good. That's good. So it's not hard on that front, right? And Drew Helm had a great paper there. Check that out. Beaconing, I think, is your best solution. Now, Fire, uh, sorry, Sysmon added this amazing feature. Zeke doesn't give me this. Sysmon can now tell me, and they added this in the past six months or so, maybe eight months, the Windows application that made the DNS request. That is solid gold. Oh, as a threat hunting source? Oh, oh, that is so good. That is so, I can't tell you how amazing. I have not had this in my threat hunting career for decades now, and now I have it, and turn this on. If you deployed Sysmon, you may have done it before they added this feature. But the threat hunting goal to tell me the Windows application or script or whatever, or VBS script running out of a temp folder, for example, with a randomly generated 16 character name, just made a DNS request, oh, that is, that is solid gold. Turn this on. Unfortunately, Firefox overrides all that. <laughs> Firefox doesn't give you that, right? <laughs> so um, uh, Firefox is going to say, nope, I'm going straight. Remember, the, the DNS request never leaves the four walls of Fire Firefox. So Sysmon never has a chance to see it. As far as Windows is concerned, your browser just made another web request. That's encrypted. That's all That's all the Windows really knows, right? It stays within the four walls of Firefox. So it does override Firefox's DOH. But again, you can turn that off. I showed you how, right? Irregardless, turn on Sysmon, well, turn on Sysmon, period. Check, the, check out Swift on security, Sysmon configuration, which is awesome, right? And uh, once you've, if you haven't already turned on Sysmon, turn it on. And then if you have it turned on the DNS part, turn that on. And then get all that threat hunting goodness, knowing which application made the DNS request. All right. That was a crash course, lightning round course on the state of DNS encryption. And by next week, some of the things I said may, may, may change. Every time I give this talk or some version of this talk, I've been doing rolling updates on it. Uh, usually day of something changes, next week something changes. So expect that. All right. So we've got some form of DNS. We understand. We have a DNS policy. And we got our arms around the state of DNS encryption. And we're managing that somehow as discussed. Now what do we do? You want to look for, as I said during my intro, um, hundreds of thousands of requests dot something dot something. That's not normal. You might request www.google.com and you know maps.google.com and finance.google.com, but it's not a thousand things.google.com. That's not normal. Malware does that all the time. One of my tunneling domains is eej.me. And yeah, I'll make a thousand different host names, quote unquote, dot eej.me. That's not normal. And that's easy to spot. Um, uh, randomly uh, high entropy meaning disorder, randomness, right? Large, large anything responses, text, null, we'll talk about null. Um, massive amounts of failures. Unfortunately, massive amounts of failures are common for poorly designed networks and applications and misconfigured stuff. And baby domains. How often does your CFO go to a domain that was registered 12 hours ago when they're not being fished? And the answer is almost never, right? Here's a Zeus botnet. 
And historically, what vendors did, they said, okay, hey, zonesandnaws.com is evil. Great. We'll put it on this block list, right? We'll, we'll put this on this reputation filter. We'll put the reputation in the gutter. And now anytime you try to go to zonesnaws.com, the reputation list says, nope, you don't go, right? And that's whack-a-mole. Why? Because today it's zonesnaws.com or, you know, 12 hours ago it's zonesnaws.com. Then eight hours later it's zonesnod.com with a D. Then eight hours later it's zonesnoff.com with an F. And they'll cycle these domains every four, eight, 12 hours faster than your block list can keep up with, and it's whack-a-mole. And it's a race condition that you're guaranteed to lose against anyone with half a brain who knows just to cycle the domains, and they do. Domain generation algorithms, so th this is easy. So um, for the criminals to evade the block list, however, what about if we say, okay, this was actually the Zeus botnet, and this was, it started at zero.pf.zonesnaws.com, one.pf.zonesnaws.com, dot, 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 dot. 12,192.pf.zonesnaws.com. That was a 12,193rd thing, counting zero, that was air quotes resolved. It's not a resolution, it's communication. If you decode the base 64, it's actually uh, encrypted. It's XOR encrypted with a key. And it's the, the notorious banking Trojan um, botnet, rather, Zeus botnet, right? So rather than putting that on a block list, reputation filter, by the time you, you check that filter, it's you know days later, just look for thousands of things, dot something, dot something, you know, or base64, the one you decode becomes um, binary data that appears to be encrypted or has high entropy. There's that word again, randomness, right? I think DNS is the ideal C2 channel. It is the best C2 channel. It is better than ICMP. ICMP makes a good tunneling channel. DNS makes a better tunneling channel. There are plenty of PCs that can't ping a site on the internet, but can resolve an internet name. And if you can resolve an internet name, you can tunnel it to the internet, right? So if, if I can sit down on a PC at your company and type NSLOOKUP, you know, google.com and get an answer, that, that thing's talking to the internet. Have a client of mine say, no, Eric, that, that's, on a, that's on a subnet with no internet access. I'm like, I just typed NSLOOKUP, google.com and got an answer. No, let's go into a local forwarder, right? A local DNS forwarder, which is a DNS proxy. We don't think of them that way, but they are. And the DNS proxy may chain through other proxies, other forward is what I mean, but ultimately some primary name server is getting that request and sending a response. So in some form or fashion, I'm sending a string of text to a primary name server, and that primary name server is sending that string of text back. And the primary name server is eej.me, one of my domains, right? It's one of them. You saw zez.me. I think it was Macedonia Montenegro, I forget now, but they had a $1 sale, .me, and because um, I'm in Maine, uh, you know, it's, it's not for me. I mean, it's, it's a top-level domain for a country. They had a $1 sale, and they had short ones, three-letter ones, which is good when you're like a buffer overflow or something, right? You know, tight spaces, short names are better, right? So three letters dot, dot two letters, sure, I'll do that. And um, so when the primary name server is Google.com, okay, fine. When the primary name server is eej.me, by the way, another server running in DigitalOcean's Cloud for $5 a month, now I've got bidirectional communication from a client to a malicious server. In my case, my pen testing malicious, my pseudo malicious, but yeah, I use that on engagements. I use DNS tunneling on virtually every pen test I do. Everyone I've done recently, it's always worked. It's, ne it's never been detected, ever, which tells you something, right? So well, there's a few things, DNS CAT2, which is great, iodine, which uh, DNS CAT2 does any TCP protocol, last I checked anyways. Iodine does any IP protocol. Yes, you can have an IPsec tunnel running via DNS. Uh, yeah, uh, great, right? Great. And um, here is uh, DNS tunnel using um, iodine and null records. Now, an another question for the uh, the folks in the room now, we've got a lot of people in the room. Uh, have you ever seen null records used for non-evil? Let me know via email, econ.gmail.com, tag me on Twitter. Have you ever seen a null record used for anything but evil? I've only seen these used for evil. I didn't know these things existed. I've done DNS for a long time. Null records are an experimental format that carries binary data. Bi I didn't know you could carry binary data via DNS. That's why we see these text records that are base64 encoded. All this malware is going through all the trouble to encode their malware in base64 to make it DNS friendly to carry a text records use a null record if you're you know and then hey binary data. The downside of binary data well null records they're easy to spot. I recommend uh, uh, block and alert any use of null records block alert test first please. You can block these in Windows DNS server through uh, options. You can add, there's actually options to do it. With bind, this is a thing called an RPZ, a response policy zone. I would block and alert after testing. I've never seen null records used for anything but evil. If you've ever looked at DNS traffic in Wireshark, you've probably never seen anything, anything like this. I hadn't until I started tunneling with iodine. This, by the way, is an SSH tunnel. 
via DNS. This SSH tunnel is going from local client in my office, where I am right now, local resolver on the same subnet, Google's DNS resolver at 8.8.8.8, my primary name server at eej.me. So yes, I'm actually SSH through Google's name server at 8.8.8.8. Right? And why did I tunnel through Google? If I can tunnel through Google, I can tunnel through anyone, virtually anyone. Right? Again, I, I've never had TNS, DNS tunnels not work. I've never had them be detected. So as a defender, turn that around. Right? And my advice is to test this stuff. Don't get fired. Make sure you have permission. Words I never want to hear in my entire life. Eric Conrad got me fired. No, no. <laughs> So with permission, get yourself a $5 VM somewhere in DigitalOcean's cloud or somewhere, set up iodine or DNS cat 2 great tool. See if you can SSH out, see if anything stops you or blocks you. And again, make sure you have permission, do not get fired, all right? <laughs> but it's easy to spot. Well, null records are easy, but you don't have to use null records. You can use text, you can use, you know, C names. However, I resolved 138things.3.eej.me. And by the way, if you're doing DNS tunneling, it's easier to use subdomains than the main domain. I, I learned that the hard way by testing this stuff. Again, there's another one of my servers. That, that's I own that uh, name, and that runs my DNS tunnel broker is also in DigitalOcean's cloud. Is it normal to resolve 138 things dot subdomain dot domain name dot TLD? No, that's not normal for anything, much less something that's ne you never heard of. You know, it's not on the Cisco umbrella top million. I guarantee you that. Right? We'll talk about those kind of checks in a bit. So look for lots of re things resolved, dot something, dot something, and the tunneling falls right out very quickly. A um, little talk about entropy now. I mentioned randomly generated names, domain generation algorithms. And so Seth and I were building 511, and we kept seeing these, these randomly generated things, randomly generated domain names called domain generation algorithms, randomly generated exe names, randomly generated, you know, uh, uh, common names and X509 certs, it's VBS names, on and on and on and on. Why is the malware doing this? The malware is doing this to avoid the reputation check, the block list. Uh, you know, they called it evil thing VBS. Well, evil thing VBS will get on someone's reputation list and block list, whatever. It, 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 it's a pattern match. The, the, that pattern will get matched and associated with malware. So they begin randomly generating their names to avoid the pattern match, to avoid the block list, the reputation check, right? So me and Seth thought, well, random, random is easy to detect. We have a tool called Ent, Entropy, Claude Shannon's Entropy, you know, the programmatic entropy. How random is this thing? Most Linux, Unix distros have an Ent tool. This is going to be easy. It's going to be like slow pitch softball, and it turns out it's hard. Why is it hard? Because ASCII is 256 values, and if the randomly generated name is uppercase, lowercase numbers, that's 26 plus 26 plus 10, that's 62 out of 256. That's not random. That's not high entropy. If I'm ignoring about one-fifth, roughly, a little less of the character space, if I'm only using sub-25% of the character space, I'm not using over 75% of the key space, any cryptanalyst would tell you that's not random. So Ant failed. Me and Seth totally failed. We failed, right? And then luckily, Mark Baggett took 511. <laughs> what a great student. <laughs> it's Seth's teaching Mark, and, and uh, Mark's taking 511 to learn more about blue team goodness. He wanted to expand, and since has, his five-team power show class for red team to a six-day red and blue and everyone, you know, all things PowerShell for defenders, et cetera. And he took 5.11 to get some ideas and Seth started asking him to do things. Hey, Mark, write a script to figure out the thing that me and Conrad could not figure out. Mark's like, clickety, 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 click here, freaked up And instead of doing ent, which is dumb, <laughs> he said, okay, how, you know, let's do a corpus. Let, let's ingest the Cisco umbrella top million, uh, most commonly uh, resolved names. Let's see which characters follow which characters from a uh, statistical uh, perspective. Like in US English, or in English I should say, Q is normally followed by U. It's not normally followed by Z. Let's do those same checks. You know, the, the odds of Q followed by U are way, way higher than the odds of uh, Q followed by Z, right? So we can actually calculate, given a corpus, like the Cisco umbrella top million, see which characters tend to follow other characters, which characters don't tend to follow other characters, then feed new names in, and see how likely they are. Brilliant, brilliant. It works really, really well. Now you have to um, you know, um, ignore some like content distribution networks, but that's easy. I get that feedback, oh, Eric, what about CDNs? And what about, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's, that's easy to whitelist. There's only so much of that stuff. It's very doable. And I think Justin Henderson had this running on a 500 site uh, WAN, rough numbers now. He tuned that thing right up. Oh, he, he's a ninja, he's a smart guy, you know, so, so is Mark. But this scales is what I'm saying, right? 
and uh, it catches stuff like this. This is a piece of malware I analyzed. Uh, I was uh, did a little um, side gig for USDOD. They gave me six months to analyze, um, or six weeks rather, to analyze ransomware in my lab. So I got to light up my lab for, for six weeks at ransomware. I clicked yes to everything. I, I said yes to macros. I enabled everything. Of course, I'm on an isolated subnet with a clean VM snapshot. And uh, I'm clicking yes to everything. I'm enabling macros. I'm channeling my true inner user. You know, I became layer eight, you know, the unofficial layer above layer seven. I was layer eight for six weeks. It's a blast. I recommend this for everyone, right? And what does this kind of stuff do? Well, beyond all the macro tricks, this document's encrypted by DocuSign. Please click here, and then it's, you're turning on macros. And then this happens. What is this? This is domain generation algorithm, right? O L Y E D A W A K A K I dot P L. And this one and this one dot work dot X Y Z dot S U. You get the idea. Many of these don't actually resolve, as you see, which is why tracking high numbers of failed resolutions is useful. The problem with tra tracking high numbers of, of failed resolutions, they're common, especially on poorly designed networks and poorly designed applications, which the world is full of. Do most you know IT teams know when there's waves of failed resolution happening? No, no. If you look, you might find millions because things are simply broken. I call it the broken windows theory of network engineering. Fix it, fix it. Sniff that network and fix that stuff as best you can. Because if you have a million a day anyways, because things are just broken and limping along, well, this becomes, looking for failed resolution for this becomes less useful. So the broken windows theory of network engineering says fix it, fix those apps, reconfigure them, make them work properly. Because at minimum, they're working more slowly. They may not be working at all. You know, Fix that stuff, then this gets easier. And in addition to high numbers of failed resolution, feed this stuff through freak.py. The beauty of freak.py, you give it any corpus you want. DNS data, here you go. Cisco umbrella top million, that's your corpus. For EXE names, feed it your Windows 10 gold master image of every EXE name on the image that you install on a clean laptop, right? And the names like notepad.exe and calc.exe and all the thousands of others, that's your corpus. Now a new name pops up on a new exe. How likely is that name character by character based on the names you already had, right? Or service service names, the, the list goes on and on. Very, very useful. So feed the resolutions through freak.py or freak server as they'll say. Check for high numbers of failed resolutions and a bit gonna check for baby domains because these are all also baby domains. Of the 50 or so it's trying to resolve, Two might actually resolve, and those two were created three hours ago. Why? To avoid the whole block listing reputation game. So they're, they're creating domains at a high uh, rate very quickly to avoid block listing and reputation checks. Meanwhile, they're creating baby domains. You can detect those with randomly generated names. You can detect no, those. Most of these will fail to resolve. You can detect that. So use their mojo against them. All, the, all these contortions the malware is going through to avoid getting on that reputation filter we're going to use their mojo against them and detect the things they're doing to avoid the block list. All that stuff to avoid the block list, random names, failed resolution, and baby domains, we'll detect that. We'll use their mojo against them, right? And again, it goes beyond DNS. It goes on and on and on. This concept, and thank you, Mark, for taking 5.11 <laughs> and sharing your, your awesomeness with the world. Um, all kinds of possibilities here. All different corpuses you want, irrespective of language, where you are in the world. Your corpus in, fr in France or Ireland or, or you know, India or, or Russia is going to be different than mine, perhaps. Your, your DNS names might be, certainly. That's okay. You know? You know, log a month's worth of normal DNS names is normal, you know, go through that. That's now your corpus, right? So your corpus may be different from mine. The beauty of freak.py, we can use our own corpuses, generate the, our own. And the next question, does it scale? Uh, I think Justin Henderson had about a half a million a second going through this. Now, plus or minus 100,000, rough numbers, that's correct. So obviously a, a script is not going to scale that high and, and Justin blew up the script. And, you know, it becomes, yeah, hey, Mark, can you like make a TCP service or a UDP service, you know, a service where I send it a string and it sends me a response with a number? Like on, on port 10,000 is my DNS freak server. On port 10,001 is my Windows uh, EXE name server. You know, on port 10,002 is my Windows service name server, each freak server, each with a respective corpus. And I send, you know, a string to port 10,000, which one of these DNS names we just looked at, something.pl. I get a number back saying how likely that name is. And I put that on a dashboard and it's showing me the 20 most recent least likely names in my SOC. And we, we check that stuff out, right? Uh, we can automate all of that too. And that's exactly what you do. Super use. It catches things that virtually nothing else does. You know, that's why you want your DNS data. That's why I spend so much time talking about getting the DNS data. Because, you know, if you don't have this, you're losing a lot. 
we've always had this very easily until about a year ago. And now, you know, and again, I, I understand what Firefox is doing. I applaud it as a citizen, but I hate to lose this. I hate to lose this at work, right? Also, other crazy things people do in DNS, sec530.com versus sec530.com, or PayPal versus PayPal. One's in Cyrillic, one's in uh, US ASCII. <laughs> character by character, virtually identical. Now, if you look very close, the A is a little bit different. But would I notice that? Would your users notice that? I'm going to miss that. Side by side is easier. Even side by side is still easy to miss. Those are called homoglyphs, right? And internationalized domain names. There's all kinds of mayhem going on there. And DNS twist. So, you know, what happens is grab any name that your users is likely to be included in a phishing campaign against your users, such as your own domain name, and see what other names have been registered that are like that. Like, did someone register, if you're PayPal, and someone suddenly registered a, a Cyrillic version of PayPal, like if you work for PayPal, you could actually see that was, that was a re, uh, somebody bought that domain. When you see someone bought that domain, you can block it at your, your next firewall can block that. So maybe you're not PayPal, you're probably not, but you're someone, you're someone who someone's going to have a phishing campaign against. So feed your own, uh, you know, names into DNS Twist for your own company. See if someone else has registered those lookalike names, Right. Uh, see who's ready and surf there and see what you get. Obviously, in some VM that's protected, it could be a real eye opener. I had students in real estate who did this, 511 students in real estate, and they found all kinds of lookalike domains. Um, the, these scam owners had harvested all their real, real, real estate data. They're reselling it, lookalike domains. They had no idea any of the, They were a real estate company. They didn't think, well, like, we're not a bank, Eric. We're a real estate company. He did one little check. He's like, oh, I'm calling the home office right now. This is like DEF CON 5. <laughs> Because he simply checked. He simply checked, right? So that's useful too. And finally, yet again, another tool by Mark Baggett. So he basically co authored this talk. Thank you, Mark. Um, he, he doesn't know that, but he did. And uh, baby domains. Now, who is, if you've ever harvested data from who is, it is a dumpster fire to harvest data out of, <laughs> which is actually an insult to actual dumpsters on fire. You know, um, why is who is a dumpster fire? Because it's plain text blobs, and each registrar has a different format, and you end up writing these giant Python or for me Perl scripts, because <laughs> Perl's better at carving data. Old man Conrad, from my cold dead hands comes Perl. You know, and um, it's 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 a nightmare to harvest data out of who is RDAP is actual JSON data. Now there's not much privacy stuff in there because GDRP has taken that out. I don't care about like people's names or phone numbers. The main thing I want is, well, what country is it in is useful. You know, if you're going to a US bank, is it registered, was it the, the, the domain registered in the US? That's useful, right? And how old is it? Those two alone give me lots of data when my CFO is clicking on a domain registered eight hours ago in Kazakhstan. Nothing against if you're a Kazakhstanian citizen, nothing against you. I'm just saying, you know, it's that's not where our bank is. Our corporate bank's not there, you know? So, I don't need all the privacy stuff. I don't need phone numbers. I just need to know what country, as a start, what country was it re uh, registered in? Does that match the actual country it's it's in? And how old is this thing? Uh, how old is this thing, right? And SANS.org was registered in the US and it was registered in 1995. All right. All things being equal with some notable exceptions, a 1995 domain is gonna be safer than a year 2000 domain registered yesterday. All things being equal, right? All right. I got that done in 48 minutes. There you go, 42 slides in 48 minutes. <laughs> I told you it's gonna be fast and furious. All right, so ericconrad.com, you can go there right now. Uh, you can download this talk right now. If I spoke too fast for you to keep up, well, you can relive all those golden moments by downloading that talk. Sometime in the next few hours, perhaps by tomorrow, this talk will appear in the same uh, link you surfed to. You can uh, play it again, slow it down. You can email me questions right there. On Twitter, I'm Eric underscore Conrad. And speaking of questions, let's check some questions. All right. Got some questions. A lot of questions. What if SNI, what if SNI is behind a content distribution network? Yes, yeah, true. So again, the, the, the SNI, uh, great question. So the server name indicator is not terribly useful for detecting DOH anyways, unless it's a known server. And if it was a known server, you knew the IP address anyways. So the fact that it could be Cloudflare doesn't really change the discussion. It, it, DOH is hard to detect regardless. The SNI doesn't give us much anyways. Great question. Is there a good list? Yes. Um, I'll post those um, on my website. Eric, I don't have the list handy that I give you a link to now, uh, Ken, but um, I'll post that to my website by tomorrow, well, by, by the weekend, just to be fair to my time and realistic with my time. Or um, I'll also tweet it out as well, Eric underscore Conrad on Twitter. I'll tweet that out. 
All right. Um, thank you for presenting. Um, so um, I'm just trying to read the question now. Thank you for presenting on this topic. What applications such as Firefox, Chrome-based browsers might provide an option to enable disable configure your own DOH resolver? They all do. So um, the the all the major browsers allow you to choose a custom server, as I have in Firefox, right? So all the browsers, and I haven't tested Microsoft Windows 10 yet, well, uh, a custom in Windows 10, but uh, yeah, I believe, I didn't do it, but I saw the option. You can do that also in Windows 10 Insider Preview. Um, I know Umbrella can block the ones it knows about. Okay, Cisco Umbrella can block, thank you, Ken. Mike Burns, you have a way, good way to generate C2 light traffic to test sensors, logs, et cetera. Yes, um, Mike, if you go to my website, I did a talk on, uh, all my talks are archived on my website, and I did a talk on at Security Onion Con. So just Google Eric Conrad Security Onion Con, or it's an older talk, it's from like three years ago. Uh, I have a bunch of PCAPs, including um, uh, encrypted DNS or tunneled DNS. You can do TCP replay. So you can grab one of my PCAPs and replay it, like, past like an IDS sensor or something. So TCP replay plus some of my encrypted DNS, tunneled DNS stuff that is on my website right now, the PCAPs are there too. Right, check that out. Want to clarify, Firefox will not log, correct. Firefox will, will not log, Sysmon will not log DNS if Firefox is using DOH. Um, if you're, so correct. Um, yes, and if uh, Firefox is not using DOH, Sysmon will log as normal. Yes, Aaron, that is true. So Firefox is not, and if DOH is not enabled in Firefox, everything's normal as before your old DO53 days. If it is enabled, Sysmon won't see it. David. Uh, yes, I already have. I already answered the question. <laughs> so thank you, Mike, for helping me answer David's question. Will you make a PCAP of the different DNS traffic available? Already done. I psychically anticipated your question, David, three years ago. And no, um, it's on my website. Just uh, find the post. I'll update the top post on my website, ericconrad.com. I'll update that with a link to my, my threat hunting, well, my security onion con talk, where I, d I delve deeply into DNS tunneling and ICMP tunneling. Again, it's on my website. It's just older. All right. Um, someone got a connection error on the survey, just FYI to the moderators. Thank you for that. Um, okay. Um, is all the information about DNS Zeke Sysmon? Yes, yeah, Security 511. Thank you, Mo uh, Mode. <laughs> I owe you an adult beverage. So if you want to learn more about this, <laughs> since a student asked, Security 511 delves into all this stuff. And TLS, we're doing a massive update now. Uh, Security 511 already covers this, but yeah. A lot of these slides came straight out of Security 511. Thank you for the reminder to pimp my own class. How embarrassing. And me and Seth are working on an update right now, due in two and a half weeks, to expand the talk on, on DNS encryption. A brand new section on TLS encryption and decryption, both active and passive, and stuff like that. Thank you, and I owe you an adult beverage, my friend. Um, especially threat hunting. Yes, same answer. <laughs> Awesome coin, where do you get one? You get one by winning Cyber Defense Net Wars version two. Great question, Steven. That's Cyber Defense Net Wars version two. You may see that, your eagle-eyed students may see that down here. That has run once so far. We ran it at the Blue Team Summit in Louisville in March, and then the world suddenly changed. <laughs> so Cyber Defense Net Wars two is done, complete, and actually debuted, and very few people have seen it because the world suddenly changed. So uh, yes, um, keep your eyes tuned on that. I know we'll be running that at some point, perhaps online. I can't promise that, but there will be an opportunity to uh, win that coin. It is a pretty awesome coin. I agree with you, Stephen. And my very biased but correct opinion, by the way. What about encrypted SNI and TLS one three? Like I said, the SNI isn't very useful, anyways. So just uh, maybe I didn't make that point clear. For DOH, the SNI isn't useful because it tells me the virtual name of the web server which has other useful purposes to your great questions, but for DOH, it's not very useful. You know, I, I, I know the DNS, the HTTPS rather request went to dns.zez.me. I could have called it anything.zez.me. So SNI is not useful for DOH analysis. It's useful for other purposes, right? How do I get one of those coins? I already answered Manuel. <laughs> How useful is Rapid7 Sonar data for DNS info? I've not used it. I've not used it. Let me know. So if uh, you want to let me know, just tweet right back at me, Eric underscore Conrad, so everyone else can see it. If anyone has opinions on Rapid7 Sonar data for DNS info, uh, tag me uh, on Twitter with your response, and I'll share it with everyone who looks. I have a local bind instance that uh, draws GOPI data. What would be a smart way to ingest them into an elk or Splunk? Currently parcel logs somewhere else. 
Don't have a fast answer for you. I think Justin Henderson, Security 555, can give you that answer, speaking of other classes. Don't have a quick answer for you, Adrian, that will require more work on my part that I can't get done in the next six minutes that I have. <laughs> great question, Adrian. You stumped me. My website's full of a gold amount of great info. Uh, that's what I try. 511 is a great class. So thank you, Aaron, for the shout out for my site. Thank you, Isaac. Great class. Remo thanks me, thank you. No, thank you. Uh, for everything that's going on in the world and all you're going through to take an hour to spend with me, to have me talk rapid fire, thank you. <laughs> but again, I want to tell you as much as I can, as much as I can, right? Love 511. Uh, more time to talk to the DNS stuff. <laughs> and thank you. All right, I covered every question. Thank you. And again, if I didn't have a good answer for the SNI, I mean, well, it, it didn't apply to DOH. It was a rapid fire talk. So, so no harm, no foul. I was talking a mile a minute because I want to say more, not less. And again, I just saw someone from Europe. Let me know how Firefox is set. I bet it's not on. So again, that was a lot to say. Thank you for attending my talk. I will add some updates to ericconrad.com. I will be tweeting stuff out about this at eric underscore Conrad. This is a fast moving subject. I'm working on the 5.11 update right now. The next two and a half weeks, that's my life. And I'm, I'm waiting knee deep, waist deep through all this stuff. So I'll have more updates to hit and more updates to share. So follow me and I'll follow you back. And thank you so much. Thank you so much for attending my talk. I had a good time. <laughs> thank you.